dulled my senses. This book he gave me to read containeth good moral. The man Shakespeare that did write it, they call immortal. He must indeed have been filled with the divine spirit. I understand from my cousin the origin of plays were religious mysteries that, freed from the superstition of early and the grossness of latter ages, the stage is now the vehicle of delight and morality. If so, to hear a good play is taking the wholesome draught of precept from a golden cup embossed with gems. And yet, my giving countenance to having one in my house, even to act in it myself, prove the ascendancy that my dear Harry hath over my heart. Ephraim Smooth is much scandalised at these doings. Come apace, good Audrey. For I am not a slut, though I thank the gods I am foul. Praise be the gods for thy foulness. Come, good Audrey, we must be married, or we must live in Baudry. Ah, Mansion is now the tabernacle of Baal. Then abide not in it. Oh, it is full of the wicked ones. Stay not amongst the wicked ones. <laughs> I must shut my ears. And thy mouth. Also, friend Ephraim, I have bidden my cousin Henry unto my house, and I shall not set bounds to his mirth to gratify thy spleen and show mine own in hospitality. Why dost thou suffer him to put into the hands of thy servants these books of tragedies, books of comedies, prelude, interlude, yea, all lewd? <laughs> my spirit doth wax wroth. I say unto thee, a playhouse is the school for the old dragon, and a playbook, the primer of Beelzebub. This is one, Mark. Not the king's crown, nor the deputed sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe, become them with one half so good a grace as mercy doth. Ah, think on that, and mercy then will breathe within your lips like man new made. Doth Beelzebub speak such words? Thy kinsman hath made all thy servants actors. To act well is good service. Here cometh the damsel for whom my heart yearneth. <laughs> oh, ma'am, his honour the squire says the play is to be as you like it. I like it not. <laughs> He's given me my character. I'm to be Miss Audrey, and brother seems to be Willie with the forest, as it were. But... How am I to get my part by heart? By often reading it. Well, I don't know. That's as good a way as any. I must study it. The gods give us joy. Thy maidens skip like young kids. Then do thou go and skip with them. Mary, thou shouldst be obeyed in thine own house, and I will do thy bidding. Ah, thou <laughs> hypocrite! To obey is easy when the heart commands. Oh, my charming cousin, how agree you and Rosalind? Are you almost perfect? Eh, what all a mortal, Clytus? Why, you're like an angry fiend broken upon the laughing gods. Come, come, I'll have nothing here but quips and cranks and wreathed smiles, such as dwell on Hebe's cheek. He says we mustn't have this amusement. But I'm a voice potential, double as the Duke's, and I say we must. Nay! Yea, by Jupiter, I swear I. Oh, I must shut my ears. The man of sin rubbeth the hair of the horse to the bowels of the cat. If agreeable to your ladyship, we'll go over your soul. I will go over it. Yeah. Trample on Shakespeare, thou sacrilegious thief, that from a shelf the precious diadem stole and put in his pocket. Silence, thou owl of Crete, and hear the cuckoo's song. To practice it, I'm content. Why, sir, what was that for? Yes, what, sir? Friend. This is a land of freedom, and I've as much right to move mine elbow as thou hast to move thine. <laughs> Why dost thou so, friend? Friend, 
This is a land of freedom, and I've as much right to move my elbow as thou hast to move thine. Verily, I could smite that Amalekite till the going down of the sun. <laughs> but, Harry, do your people of fashion act these follies themselves? Aye, and scramble for the top parts as eager as for star, ribboned, place, or pension. And no wonder, for a good part in a play is the first good character some of them ever had. <laughs> Lamp, decorate out the seats, smart and theatrical, and thrill the servants I've given small parts to. I wished for some entertainment to please those I have invited, but will convert these follies into a charitable purpose. Tickets for this day shall be delivered unto my friends gratis, but money to their amount I will, after rewarding our assistance, distribute amongst the indigent of the village. Thus, whilst we please ourselves and perhaps amuse our friends, we shall make the poor happy. An angel! <laughs> if Sir George doesn't soon arrive, I may, I think, marry her angelic ladyship. But will that be honest? She's nobly born, though I suspect I had ancestors myself, if only I knew who they were. <laughs> what must she imagine when I'm discovered that I am a scoundrel? And consequently, though I should possess her hand and fortune, instead of loving, she'll despise me. I want a friend now, to consult. Deceive her I will not. Poor Dick Busking wants money more than myself, yet this is a measure I'm sure he'd scorn. No, no, I must not. Now I hope my passionate father will be convinced this is the first time I was ever here. Eh? What beau is here? Astonishing! My old strolling friend. Oh, I don't know what to do. Nor what to say. Dick Buskin! Why, my dear fellow, talk of the devil, and I was just thinking of you. Oh, on my soul, Dick. I'm so happy to see you. But, Jackie, <laughs> perhaps you found me out. Found you? I'm sure I wonder how the deuce you found me out. The news of my intended play has brought you. He doesn't know as yet who I am, so I'll carry it on. So, you too have broken your engagement with Truncheon at Winchester, figuring it away in your stage close to, eh? Really, tell us what you're at here, Jack. Will you be quiet with your jacking? I'm now Squire Harry. What? I've been pressed into service by an old man of war who found me at an inn and claiming I'm son to a Sir George Thunder. Here, in that character, I flatter myself I have won the heart of the charming lady of this house. <laughs> now the mystery's out. So it was my friend Jack who's been brought here for me. Tell me, Jack, do you know the young gentleman they take you for? No, but I am pleased to say he is honored in his representative. Upon <laughs> <laughs> my soul, Jack, you're a very high fellow. I am. Now I can put some pounds in your pocket. <laughs> We're getting up as you like it. Let's see, in the cast, have I a part for you? I'll take touchstone from Lamp. You shall have it, my boy. I'd resign Orlando to you with any other Rosalind, but the lady of the mansion plays it herself. The very lady my father intended for me. Do you love her, Jack? To distraction. But I'll not have her. No? Why? Because she thinks me a gentleman. And I'll not convince her. I am a rascal. I'll continue with our play, as the produce is appropriate to a good purpose. Then I'll lay down my squireship, bid adieu to my heavenly Rosalind, and exit forever from her house, poor Jack Rover. The generous fellow I ever thought him, and he shan't lose by it. If I could make him believe... Aha! Well... This is a most whimsical affair. You've anticipated, superseded me. You'll scarce believe I'm come here too. Purposely, though, to pass myself off as this young Harry. No. I am. Harry! Where are you? <laughs> Who's that? I'll try it. My father will be personally vexed, but no other way. Someone called Harry. 
If the real Simon Pure should be arrived, I'm in a fine way. Be quiet! That's my confederate. Hey? Eh? He's to personate the father. Sir George Thunder. He started the scheme, having heard that a union was intended, and Sir George, not immediately expected. Our plan is, if I can, before his arrival, flourish myself into the lady's good graces, and I'll win her up, as she is an heiress. Yes, but who is this comrade? One of my former company. He's a devilish good actor in the old men. Oh. Then, t'was on this plan that you parted with me on the road, standing like a finger post. I walk up this road, and you walk down that. Why, Dick, I had no idea you were half so capital a road. <laughs> I didn't know my forte lay that way, till persuaded by this experienced stager. He must be an impudent scoundrel. Who is he? Do I know him? Why, no, I hope not. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> his name is... Uh, it's... Abrawang! Abrawang? <laughs> I never heard of him. But Dick, why would you let him persuade you to such a scandalous affair? Why, Faith, I would have been offered too. But once he takes a project into his head, the devil himself can't drive him out of it. Yes, but the constable may drive him into Winchester jail. Hey, your opinion of our intended exploit has made me ashamed of myself. Harky Jack, to frighten and punish my adviser, you still keep your character of young Squire Thunder. You can easily do that, as he, no more than myself, has ever seen the young gentleman. But by heaven, I'll quit him down, Bardolph. Yes, but Jack, if you can marry her, her fortune is a snug thing. Besides, if you love each other... Hang I... her fortune! My love, more noble than the world's, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. But Dick... She is the most lovely, but you shall see her. She is female beauty in its genuine decoration. <laughs> this is the drollest. Rover little suspects that I am the identical Squire Thunder which he personates. I'll lend him my character a little longer. Oh, yes, this offers a most excellent opportunity of making my poor friend's fortune without injuring anybody. If possible, he shall have her. I can't regret the loss of charms I never knew. And as for an estate, my father's is competent to all my wishes. Lady Amranth, by marrying Jack Rover, will gain a man of honour, which she might miss in an hour. It may tease my father a little at first, but he's a good fellow in the main, and once he comes to understand my motive, he will own. Eh? This must be she. An elegant woman, Faith. <clears throat> now, for a little finesse, to continue her in the belief that Jack is the man she thinks him. Madam, a word of you, please. Who art thou, friend? I've scarce time to warn you against the dangers you are in of being imposed upon by your uncle, Sir George. How? He has heard of your ladyship's partiality for his son, but is so incensed at the irregularity of Henry's conduct that he intends, if possible, to disinherit him and to prevent your honouring him your hand, has engaged me and brought me hither to pass me on you for him, designing to treat the poor young gentleman himself as an impostor in hopes you'll banish him your heart and house. Is Sir George really such a parent? Why, well, I thank thee for thy caution. What is thy name? Richard Buskin, ma'am. The stage is my profession. In the young squire's late excursion, we contracted an intimacy, and I saw so many good qualities in him that I could not think of being an instrument of his ruin, nor deprive your ladyship of so good a husband as I'm certain he'll make you. Then Sir George intends to disown him. Yes, ma'am. I've this moment told the young gentleman of it, and he's determined, for a jest, to return the compliment by seeming to treat Sir George himself as an impostor. <laughs> Twill be a just retaliation, and indeed what my uncle deserveth, for his cruel intentions, both to his son and to me. What? Has he run away again? That's my uncle. <laughs> and here is my father, and my standing out that I am not his son will rouse him into the heat of battle. 
Now mind, madam, how he will dub me Squire Harry. Well, my lady, wasn't it my wild road that set you all to the carcamella capers you've been cutting here in the garden? See here, I have brought him into the line of battle again. You villain, why'd you drop a stern there? Throw a slew shot, bust a bob stay, spring to, and come down straight as a mast, you dog. Uncle, who is this? Who is he? <laughs> that is an odd question to the fellow who has been three hours with you cracking walnuts. He is bad at his lesson. Why, certainly, when he runs away from school. Why don't you speak, you lover? You're cursed modest now, but before I came, it was all amongst the poses. Here, my lady, take from a father's hand Harry Thunder. That is what I may not. Dinner. I thought you disgust her, you blackfish. Uncle, take from my hand Harry Thunder. Hey! So this is our sham Sir George. Yes, I bring tell the lady about it, and she'll seem to humour him. I shan't, though. How do you do, Abrawine? Abrawine! Why, you look like a good actor. Sure. Aye, that's very well indeed. I never lose sight of your character. Sure. You know, Sir George is a noisy, sure. turbulent, I... wicked old seaman. Ah! Bravo! Out your underlip, purse your brows. Very well. But, damn it, Abrawine, you should have put a little red upon your nose. Ah! Kind of old. Never play an angry old man no. with a red nose. That's it. Strut about on your little pegs. <laughs> I am in such a fury! Oh, that? Why, your figure is the happiest comic squab I ever saw. Show only yourself, and you'll set the audience in uproar. Oh, blood and fire! Keep it up. I like fun. Uncle, who is this? Some puppy unknown! And you don't know this gentleman? Excellently well. He's a fishmonger. The what? <laughs> Determined not to know each other. Come, Dick, give the lady a specimen of your talents. Motley is your only wear. I met a fool in the forest. Here comes Audrey. Salutations and greetings to you all. Trip, trip a pace, good Audrey. Well, wow, Warrens, what features? What? What's this? The homely thing, sir, but she's mine own. <laughs> Yours? Oh, you most audacious. What is slut? I thank the Lord for my sluttishness. Ah! <laughs> you know this youth? My friend Horatio. I wear him in my heart's core. Yea, in my heart of hearts, as I do thee. <gasps> Such freedom with my niece before my face. Do you know this lady, sir? Do you know my son? Be quiet. Jaffier has discovered the plot, and you can't deceive the Senate. Though my conscience wouldn't let me carry it through. Aye, his conscience hanging about the neck of his heart. Say, good Lancelot, and good Garbo, as aforesaid, good Lancelot Garbo, take to thy heels and run! Why, my lady, explain, scoundrel and puppy unknown! Uncle, I am told thy father was kind to thee. Return this kindness to thy child. If the lamb in wanton play doth fall amongst the waters, the shepherd taketh him out, instead of plunging him deeper till he dieth. Though thy hairs now be grey, they were once flaxen. In short, he is too old in folly who cannot excuse it in youth. I'm an old fool! Well, that's civil of you, madam niece. And I'm a grey shepherd with her visions and vines and lambs in a ditch. But as for you, young Mr. Goat, Oh, but My you! My dear Mr. Abrawang, give up the game. Her ladyship, in seeming to take you for her uncle, has been only humming. Ah! What the devil! Don't you think the fine creature knows her true-born uncle? Certainly, to be sure, she knows me! You have done! Soons, man! My honoured father was here himself today. Her ladyship knows his person. Your honoured father? And who's your honoured self? Now by my father's son, and that's myself. It shall be some moon or a Cheshire cheese before I budge, still crossed and crossed. What do you bore out to me about Cheshire cheeses for? I say... And I say, as the 
saying is, your friend Dick has told me all. But to convince you of my forgiveness in our play, as you're a rough and tucker, I'll cast you Charles the Wrestler. Now I do Orlando. I'll trip up your heels before the whole court. <laughs> trip up my heels. Why, damn me, I'll turn you, you ungrateful chick of an old pelican. Oh, yeah. oh. What you at here? Cutting the people about? But, uh, Mr. Buckskin, I have to have a word with you in private. Buckskin! Ah! All the world's a stage, and all the men and women. All the men are rogues and the women asses! I'll make a clear stage. Yeah. Oh, sir, it's just a rehearsal. That's you! Yeah. George, let's stop this. How dare you call me George! Oh, my you, you, you slut! Master, 
by concealing from him that my brother was in orders. He, flattered with the hopes of procuring me an establishment, gave in to the supposed imposter and performed the ceremony. Duplicity, even with good intent, is ill. Madam, the event has justified your censure. For my husband, not knowing himself bound by any legal ties, abandoned me. I, I followed him to the Indies, distracted, still seeking him. I left my infant at one of our settlements. But on my return, after a fruitless pursuit, I found the friend to whose care I had committed my child was compelled to retire from the ravages of war. But where? I could not learn. Rent with agonizing pangs, now without child or husband, I again saw England and my brother, who, wounded with remorse for being the cause of my misfortune, secluded himself from the joys of social life and invited me to partake the repose of solitude in that humble shelter from whence we've both just now been driven. My pity can do thee no good, yet I pity thee. But as resignation to what must be may restore peace, if my means can procure thee comfort, they are at thy pleasure. Come, let thy grief subside. Instead of thy cottage, accept thou and thy brother every convenience my mansion can afford. Madam, I can only thank you. My thanks are here. Thou shalt be cheerful. I shall introduce you to my sprightly cousin Harry and his father, my humorous uncle. We have delights going forward that may amuse thee. Kind lady, come, smile. Though a Quaker thou seest, I am merry. The sweetest joy of wealth and power is to cheer another's drooping heart and wipe from the pallid cheek the tear of sorrow. <laughs> Why, we've been long upon our shifts, and after all our tricks, twists, and turns, as that there was then too hot for us. Our track to Portsmouth was a hit. Aye, but since the cash be touched upon pretending to be able bodied seamen, has come up to the last shilling, as we have deserted, the means of a fresh supply to take us back to London must be fought on. As to recruit the pocket, that has it in the neck. By an advertise, advertisement posted on the stocks yonder, there are highwaymen upon this road. Thirty guineas are offered by this way, lazy, owner of the estate round here, to him who shall apprehend one of these collectors. I wish we could snap up any straggler to bring before her. A quick who will only require a yea for an oath. We might sack these thirty guineas. Yes, but we must take care. If we fall into hands of this gentleman that's in pursuit of us, Death isn't, isn't that his man that you're boasting it's done? Run. I think we three are a match for him. Instantly put on your characters of sailors, we may get something out of him. A pitiful story makes an impression on the soft heart of a true tar. They'll open his hard hand and drop you his last kidney. If we can but make him believe we were pressed, we have him. Only mind me. To rattle my lantern. Sir George's temper now always blows a hurricane. <coughs> what ya? Ahoy! Uh, Bob, up your speaking trumpet. Um, uh, uh, well, you see, brother, um, this is the thing. But these should be my deserters. We three hands just come home from long voyage. What pressed in the river, and without letting us see our friends, brought round to Portsmouth. And there we entered freely. Cause why? We had no choice. no choice. Then we run. We hear some gentleman is in chase of us. So as the shot is all out, we'll surrender. Surrender? Oh, then you've no shot left indeed. Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't the loading of a gun about me now. And this same one's your poverty is a bitter bad enemy. They are the deserters that I'm after. Meet me in an hour's time. In the little wood yonder, I'll raise a wind to blow you to safe latitude. Keep out to sea. 
My masters, the rock you're certainly split upon. Why, this is the first time we ever saw you, but we'll steer by your chart. But I never knew one sea man to betray another. <laughs> then they've been pressed. I can't blame them so much for running away. Yes, Sir George will certainly hang them. I wouldn't. They shall eat beef and drink the king's health. Run and tell them so. Uh, stop. I'll tell them myself. Well, now you are yourself, and a kind of gentleman, as you used to be. Since these idle rogues are inclined to return to their ships, they shan't born sea store. Here, take them this money. Uh, oh, I'll take it there myself, and advise them as though they were my own children. <laughs> Mr. Aberlein take. Dick Buskin, I think, has no suspicion of my intentions. Such a choleric spark will fight, I dare say. If I fall or even survive this affair, I'll leave the field of love and the fair prize to the young man I've personated. For I am determined to see Lady Amaranth noble. Ah, here comes Aberlein. <laughs> Now, to relieve these foolish seagulls, they must be hovering somewhere about this coast. Ha! Puppy unknown! You, sir, are the very man I was seeking. You are not ignorant, Mr. Abrawang. Mr. what? So, you will not resign your title. Very well, I'll indulge you. Sir George Thunder, you honoured me with a blow. <laughs> Did it hurt you? Stead! Sir, as it is my pride to reject even favours, no man shall offer me an injury. Hey, In rank, we're equal. Oh, we faith! The English of all of this is that we are to fight. Sir, you've marked on me an indelible stain, only to be washed out by blood. Why, I only have one objection to fighting you. What's that, sir? And you're too brave a lad to be killed. Brave? Why, sir, at present I wear the stigma of a coward. Ah, zooms! I like a bit of fighting. Haven't had a morsel in a long time. Don't know when I've smelt gunpowder, but to bring down a woodcock. Take your ground. Yes, but are we to thrust with bulrushes like two little frogs, or pelt each other with nuts like two little squirrels? I see no other weapons here. Oh, yes, sir. Here are the weapons. Well, this is bold work. For a privateer to give battle to a king's ship. Try your charge, sir, and take your ground. I would not want to burn, sink, or destroy what I thought was built for good purpose. But damn me if I don't wing you to teach you better manners. Oi! Here's the honest fellow who's brought some cash. We're betrayed! It's the very man that's in pursuit of us. And this promise was only a decoy to throw us into his power. The pistol! We'll secure it! Yes. Ah, boys! Ah, you have our lives, now we'll have yours! Give me the money! Unhand me, sir! Rascals! My dear boy! Oh! No, no you shan't! With the rose! Never mind the rose! Yes. Ah. Ah. I might just see my preserver perish! Ah. Well, I know I'm your preserver, and I will perish, but I will bring you out of harm's way! Oh, you would fight me himself! Sure, we know you would fight the devil! He saved my life! Oh, save your life! So hey, all up my noble little brat! <laughs> trifling goods. Aye, you know how you've gone up to the big house with your complaint. Well, her ladyship's steward, to be sure, has made me give back your cottage and farm, but your goods I seize for myself. Only leave me a few necessaries. 
by the goodness of my neighbours. And they soon redeem what the law has put into your hands. The affair is now in my lawyer's hands, and defendant and plaintiff talking about it is all smoke. Favour, don't be so cruel to Mr. Banks. I'll mark what I may wish to keep for myself. Stay here and make sure that not even a pin's worth be removed without my knowledge. I'll be dumb if I'll be your watchdog to bite the poor. That I won't. <laughs> Mr. Banks, as favour, intend to put up your goods at auction. If you could but not get a friend to buy the choice of them from you again. Sister Jane has got steward to advance her quarter's wages. And when I've gone to sell corn for favour, besides presents, well, I've made a market penny now and then. Here, it's not much, but every little helps. I thank you, my good-natured boy, but keep your money. Last summer, you saved me from being drowned in Blackpool. You'll not take this beak or I'll directly fling it in there. Let the old Nick save her from being drowned if you can. Now take it. I Do no, take it. No. Don't just, just take it. <laughs> My kind lad. Then I'll not hurt your feelings by opposing your liberality. Hey, hey, hey. You've given my heart such a pleasure as I have never felt, nor I'm sure favour for me. But Sim, whatever may be his opinion of worldly prudence, remember, he's your parent. Or he will. Let me see. One elbow chair, one claw table. The confusion into which Lady Amaranth's family is thrown by the sudden departure and apprehended danger of her young cousin must have prevented her ladyship from giving that attention to our affairs that I'm sure was her inclination. If I can but prevail on my brother too to accept her protection, I can't enjoy the delights of her ladyship's hospitable mansion and leave him here, still subject to the insults of the churlish farmer. Heavens, who's this? What a race I've at last got from the bloodhounds. If old Abrawang had but followed and backed me, we'd have tickled their catastrophes. But when they got me alone, three upon one were odds. So, safe's the word. What did they want with my life? If printed, it wouldn't sell for sixpence. Right? Whose house is this I have dashed into? <laughs> the friendly cottage of my old gentleman. Are you at home? Gad, sir, uh, I had a hard struggle for it. Yes, murder was their intent. Then it was well for me that I was born without brains. <laughs> I'm very weak. Faint. Sir, I want you well. <laughs> Madam. I ask pardon. <clears throat> yes, ma'am, very well. Now exceedingly well. I, I got into an affray there, a kind of hobble with some worthy gentlemen. <laughs> Only honest farmers, I fancy, mistook me for a sheaf of barley, for they down with me and threshed so heartily that, gad, their flails flew merrily about my ears. But I up, and when I could no longer fight like a mastiff, I ran like a greyhound. <laughs> but, dear ma'am, pray excuse me. This is very rude, Faith. You seem disturbed, sir. Will you take some refreshment? Oh, madam, you're very good. Only a little of your current wine. If I don't forget, it stands just... <laughs> madam, I have the honour of drinking to your health. I hope you're not hurt, sir. A little better, but very faint still. <laughs> I had a sample of this before and liked it so much that, madam, won't you take another? Sir. Madam, if you'd been fighting as I have, you'd well, well. <sighs> now I'm as well as any man in Illyria. Got a few hard knocks, though. <laughs> you'd better repose a little. You seemed much disordered coming in. Why, ma'am, you must know. Thus, it was... Uh... Come, ma'am. Mr. Gammon says this chair is wanted to make up the half dozen of... What? What's all this? Why, the furniture seized on execution. 
And a man must do his duty. Then, villain, know that a man's first duty is tenderness and civility to a woman. Heavens, where's my brother? This gentleman will bring himself into trouble. Master, do you see I am a representative for his honour, the high sheriff? Every high sheriff should be a gentleman. And when he is represented by a rascal, he is dishonoured. Damn it! I might as well live about Covent Garden and every night get a beating from the watch. For here among groves and meadows, I'm always squabbling with constables. Come, come, I must! As you say, sir, last Wednesday, so it was. Sir, your most obedient, humble sir. Pray, sir, may I take the liberty to know were you ever astonished? What? Because, sir, I intend to astonish you. My dear fellow, give me your hand. Oh. <laughs> now, sir, you are astonished. Yes, but, sir, I am so you with an action. Right. Suit the action to the word, and the word to the action. See if the gentlewoman be not affrighted. Michael, I'll make thee an example. Oh, fine example, this one. Good to seize him by the law and Thou worm and maggot of the law! Hop me over every kennel, or you shall hop without my custom! I don't value your custom! You are astonished. Now, I'll amaze you! No, I won't be amazed! Say my own Hop! Stop, ma'am. These sort of gentry are unpleasant company for a lady. I'll just see him to the door, and then... I'll see him outside the door. Madam, I'm your most obedient, humble sir. I feel a strange curiosity to know who this young gentleman is. He must have known the house by the freedom. But then his gaiety, without familiar rudeness, native elegance of manners and good breeding seem to make him at home anywhere. My brother, I think, must know. Amelia, did you see the young man that was here? Some ruffians and a posse of the country people have bound and dragged him from our door on the allegation of free men. We just swear he has robbed them. How? He did enter here in confusion as if pursued, but I'll stake my life on his innocence. The freedom of his censures on Farmer Gammon's conduct and the friendly office he did me have brought the sordid churl's malice upon him. And he has encouraged these ruffians in hopes of the reward offered by Ephraim Smooth for apprehending footpads to drag the young fellow up the Lady Amaranth, where the farmer says he has already appeared in a feigned character. I'll speak to Lady Amaranth, and in spite of calumny, he shall have justice. He would not let me be insulted because he saw me an unprotected woman without a husband or a son. And shall he want an advocate? Brother, come. not a soul in the house but myself. My lady sent all the folks around the country to search for the young squire. Oh, she'll certainly bring her if anything happens to him. Oh, I don't wonder at it. He's such a dear, sweet gentleman. Pity of it is, his going spoils all our fine play, and I just got my part quite by heart. However, I must do out the room for Mr. Banks' sister. My lady's invited her here. The man John Dory hath carried the man George hither in his arms, and has locked him up. Coming into the house, they did look to me like a blue lobster with a shrimp in his claws. Oh, here is the damsel I love. And alone. They say, when folks look in glass at night, they can see the black gentleman. Thou art employed in vanity. Well, who wants you? It is natural for woman to love man. Well, yes, but not such ugly men as you. <laughs> Why would you come in here to frighten me? You know there's no one in the house but ourselves. I am glad of that. 
I am the elm, and thou the honeysuckle. Oh, let thy arms entwine me. Oh, what a rogue is here! But yonder comes my lady, and I'll show him off to her in his true colours. Oh, clasp me round. Well, I will, if you'll take off your hat and make me a fine low bow. I cannot bend my knee, nor take off my beaver. Well then, you're very impudent. Go along. But to win thy favour. Now, kneel down to me. I cannot. But one lovely smile may smile me down. <laughs> now, read me a speech out of this fine playbook. I read a play. Abomination! But, Jane, wilt thou kiss me? I kiss a man? Abomination! <laughs> but you may take my hand. Oh, tis a comfort to the lip of the faithful. How? Ah, oh, thou sly and deceitful hypocrite! There, ma'am, is a demure holy man who will prevent our play. So severely censure others and put fetters on me, which now I'm determined to break. Verily, Mary, I was buffeted by Satan in the shape of a damsel. Go! <laughs> my spirit is sad, though my feet move so nimble. Oh, but heavens, no tidings of my dearest Henry. Jane, let them renew the search. Here's Madame Amelia. You see, I've got her room quite ready, my lady. But I'll make Brother Zim search for the young squire. Madam, might I implore your influence? Friend, thou art ill accommodated here. But I hope thou wilt excuse. My mind is a sea of trouble, my, my peace shipwrecked. Oh, friend, hast thou seen my cousin Henry? Thou too, all who knew him must be anxious for his safety. How unlucky this servant to prevent Sir George from giving him that assistance which paternal care and indeed gratitude demanded, for it was filial affection which led him to pursue those wicked men. Heave ahead! Come, you do! Ross! Whip me up like a pound of tea and dance me about like a young bear and make me quit the preserver of my life. Yes, Poppy and Noble think I'm a poltroon and afraid to follow and suck at them. One may as well turn your hat, but this night you shall not budge. On! For mercy of heaven, isn't it, eh, master? Give only one look. My husband! It's my Amelia! Brief the foresail! First you cracked her heart by shearing off, now you want to overset her by bringing two. Hold soft, she recovers. Are you at length returned to me, my Seymour? Seymour? Her mind is disturbed. This is mine uncle, Sir George Thunder. No, no, my lady. She knows what she is saying very well. Niece, I have been a villain to this lady, I confess. But my dear Amelia, Providence has done you justice in part. From the first month I quitted you, I have not entered one happy hour in my journal. And hearing that you found it, and considering myself the cause, the worm of remorse has since gnawed at my timbers. You're not still offended with me? Me? If you could but forgive my offence, and condescend to take my hand as an atonement. Your hand? Do you forget? We are already married. Aye. That was my rascality. You may say that. Amelia, my dear, that marriage, I'm ashamed to own it, but it was... Was as good as if you had been lashed together by the chaplain of the eagle. <laughs> Hold your tongue, you impudent crib! You panda! You bad advisor! I'll strike my false colours. I now admit that the chaplain that you provided was... Was a good man, and a greater honour to his black than your honour to his blue cloth. Eh? By the word of a seaman, here he is himself. Your brother? Captain Seymour! My dear Banks! I shall make every reparation. Amelia shall really be my wife. 
that, sir, my sister is already. For when I performed the marriage ceremony, which you only took as a cloak of your deception, I was actually in orders. Now who's the crimp and the panda? <laughs> I didn't tell you this since, because I thought a man's own reflections were the best punishment for betraying an innocent woman. You shall be post, Captain. Sink me if you shan't. <laughs> Madam, my inmost soul partaketh of thy gladness and joy for thy reformation. But, uncle, thy prior marriage to this lady annulled the subsequent, and my cousin Harry is not now thy heir. So much the better. He is an unnatural cub. But, Amelia, I flatter myself, I have a, an heir, my infant boy. Ah, oh, husband, you had. Go. Well, well, I have been a miserable scoundrel. Yes, I will. If my son Harry continues in his unworthy disobedience, I'll adopt that brave, kind lad that wouldn't let anybody kill me but himself. He shall have my estates. That's my own acquisition. Niece, marry him. Puffy Unknown's a fine fellow. And Amelia, if not for him, you would never have found your husband, Captain Seymour, in Sir George Thunder. How are you Sir George Thunder? Oh. I didn't tell you that at the time, because I thought you might be for finding him out too soon, and up stall. Please you, madam. Leave a footpad in custody. I am come to sit in judgment, for there is a bad man in my house, Mary. Then why don't you get out of it? <laughs> Bring him before me, before you, old squint of us. And perhaps you don't know. I'm a magistrate! I will examine him! You'll be damned! I'll examine him myself. Bring him before me! I'll give him a passport to the Winchester Bilbo's. Oh, sir, as you hope for mercy, extend it to this youth. For even should he be guilty, from our knowledge of his benevolent and noble nature, I think, next to an impossibility, allow for the services he rendered to us. He protected, relieved your forsaken wife and her unhappy brother in the hour of want and sorrow. What? Amelia plead for a robber? Consider, my love, justice is above bias or partiality. If my son violated the laws of his country, I would serve him up a victim to public disgrace and humiliation. Ah, oh, my impartial uncle. Speak thou, or oh, hold thy clapper thou. <coughs> Who are the prosecutors? Call in well, the Nobody stop his mouth. Who are the prosecutors? Then, tell his worship the justice. A justice? Oh, the devil! I thought we should have nothing but Quakers to deal with. Come, how did this fellow rob you? Zoops! We were wrong! This is the very- Clap right. down the hatches! Secure these sharks! I thought I should find you here, Admiral Wang. And that you'd have some knowledge of these fellows. Heavens, my cousin Harry! The devil! Isn't this my spear and shield? My young master! Well, what have you been at here? These rights may yet be wanted. My dear fellow, are you safe? Oh, yes, Dick. I was brought here very safe, I assure you. A confederate in custody below has made a confession of their villainy, that they concerted this plan to accuse him of robbery. First, for revenge. Then, in hopes to share the reward for apprehending him, he also owns that they are not sailors, though they fraudulently took the bounty, but depredators on the public. Keep them safe in limbo. And so, not knowing that the justice of the beast and they brought this lad now here before was the very man they attacked. <laughs> the rogues have fallen into their own snare. What now? You're a justice of the peace. Well said, Admiral Wang. Then, Sir George, you know him too? No puppy unknown to be sure. Still Sir George. So, you will not resign your knighthood. Madam, I am happy to see you again. How do you do, my kind host? Cousin, I rejoice at thy safety. Be reconciled to him. Reconciled? If I do not love, honour and respect him, I am not worthy of the life that he saved. But, who is he? Sir, he is the Dick, one. Dick, I thank you for your good wishes, but I am determined not to impose on this lady. Madam, 
as I had first told this well-meaning tar when he dragged me to your house. I am not the son of Sir George Thunder. No? Then I wish you the son of an admiral, and I your father. Then you'll not have her to punish you. I've a mind to take Stop her myself. It. If I who adore her won't, you shall not. No, no, madam. Never mind what this fellow says. He's as poor as myself, isn't he, Abrawang? Then, my dear Rover, <laughs> since you are so obstinately disinterested, I'll no longer tease my father, whom you here see, and in your strolling friend, his very truant Harry, ran from Portsmouth School to join you and fellow comedians. Indeed? Forgive me, cousin, if through my zeal for the happiness of my friend, I endeavoured to promote yours by giving you a husband more worthy than myself. Am I to believe? Madam, is your uncle Sir George in this room? He is. Tis <laughs> so you, in reality, what I have had the impudence to assume, and I perplex your father with my ridiculous effrontery. I told you. I insisted I was not the gentleman you took me for, but you had thrust me into your chariot and dragged me hither. I am ashamed and mortified. Madam, I take my leave. Thou art welcome to go. Sir George, as the father of my friend, I cannot raise my hand against you, but I hope, sir, you will apologize to me. I with pleasure, my noble splinter. Now tell me, from what dock were you launched, my heart of oak? I've heard, sir, in England, but from my earliest knowledge, till within a very few years, I've been in the East Indies. Ah, beyond seas, well. And how? It seems I was committed an infant to the care of a lady who was herself obliged to decamp without beat of drum, leaving me a little chubby fellow spotted on the carpet. A sergeant's wife alone returned and snatched me off triumphant through fire, smoke, cannon, cries, and carnage. Does that work, sir? Can you recollect the name of the town where you were Yes, ma'am. The town was Negapatnam. Well, thank you, sir. An officer who'd rather act scrub on the stage than hotspur in the field brought me up behind the scenes on the Calcutta Theatre. I was rolled on the boards, acted myself into the favour of a colonel, promised a pair of colours, but, impatient to find my parents, hid myself in the steerage of an homeward-bound ship, assumed the name of Rover from the uncertainty of my fate, and, having murdered more poets than Rajas, stepped on English ground. Unencumbered with rupees or pagodas, wouldst thou come home so, little Ephraim? I would bring myself home with some money. Excuse my curiosity, sir. What was the lady's name in whose care you were left? She was the lady of a major Linstock, but I've heard my mother's name was Seymour. Why? Uh, Amelia! My son! Madam! <laughs> it is my child! Hey. Thou seest he is my gay, gallant, generous cousin. So low, low, though I've never heard it before, my heart told me he was a chip off the old block. Your father. Can it? Heaven. When I have attempted to raise my envious hand against a father's life. Why, dear brave boy. My son, with the spirit to fight me as a stranger, yet defend me as a father. And knowing her only as a woman wronged, to protect his helpless mother. And by relieving the stranger, Charles, you little thought twas an uncle you snatched from prison. Nor that thou, by that benign action, did first engage the esteem of thy fond cousin. Uncle, you'll recollect twas I who first introduced a son to thee. Aye, and I hope you will next introduce a grandson to me, young slyboots. Harry, you've lost your fortune. <laughs> yes, sir, but I've gained a brother whose friendship, before I knew him to be such, I prized above any fortune in England. My dearest Rosalind. Then will you take our Charles? Yes, but only on condition that thou bestowest thy fortune on his friend and brother. Mine is sufficient for us, is it not? Angelic creature, to think of my generous friend. But now, for as you like it, <laughs> where's lamp and trap? 
I shall ever love a play. A spark from Shakespeare's muse of fire was the star that guided me through my desolate and bewildered maze of life and brought me to these unexpected blessings. <laughs> to merit, friends, so good, so sweet a wife, the tender husband be my part for life. My wild oats so <coughs> let candid thespian laws decree that glorious harvest. Your applause! never stood in the limelight before. <laughs> you were amazing, absolutely amazing. Yes. I know you've been practicing, rehearsing since January, and I know it's been hard work, but you've obviously had a lot of fun as well. I have a number of people to thank on your behalf. I have a long list here. People behind the scenes, the stage man management and production, set design and build, superb, isn't it? The lighting, wow, how do you play to this? Uh, the sound and your singing was wonderful. The costumes, which I understand some of them were made by one person, I don't know where, this, where she is. <laughs> The direction team, you can tell I'm not a professional, I'm the only one who has to use a microphone. <laughs> you have so much confidence, which I lack, please give me some. But above all, the overall director, Angela Hardcastle. Superb. Sandy Sharp, who has helped us through the whole thing, uh, the matrons backstage who have looked after the, the young people, the Electric Theatre, our kind hosts here, and especially three young professionals who have helped me right the way through this whole production, uh, our Deputy Stage Manager, Crystal Drame, who is about to go and train as a technician at Central uh, School of Speech and Drama, and uh, she has been our, our Deputy Stage Manager throughout and been wonderful. Um, Isaac Jones, who's not here tonight, who has been our voice coach, 
Uh, he was with the Youth Theatre for two productions and then trained at Central, at the Central School, and came back voluntarily to help these young people with their voice work and was absolutely terrific. Um, and lastly, and not least, uh, my assistant director, Steve Andrews, who's been at my side the whole time Ooh. through. We'd like to thank you. justice to this lovely play uh, and thank you for your support I hope you'll come and see us next year we're hoping to present a musical production not here but at the Rhoda McGaw Theatre in Woking and we look forward to seeing you then good night thank you.